Thank you very much, uh, everyone. I love to start on time and I hope to finish on time. It's a very short, succinct session today, 45 minutes. We're going to discuss a topic that we encounter every day in the cath lab for treatment of small vessel disease to stent or not to stent. The learning objective today, we want to really define and be clear about what we're talking about when we say small vessel disease. We want to learn from our panelists and our speakers the tips and tricks in performing small vessel disease intervention, how to do it well, how to make it durable. And lastly, to discuss the pros and cons of treating small vessel disease with either the strategy of drug eluding balloon or drug eluding stents. So my name is Jack, your anchor person for today from Singapore. Our two esteemed speakers are Raj, Raja Gopal from Brunei, as well as Dr. Fahim Jaffrey from Singapore. Our discussions include uh, Dr. Rosli Muhammad Ali Dato from Malaysia, Dr. Hui from Vietnam, Dr. Chin Chiang from Singapore, my good colleague. Our remote discussion include Dr. Sunny Sung from Hong Kong, and we'd like to thank our chat master, Dr. Kwa J. Lee, for monitoring the online feedback and uh, our questions, and we'll endeavor to answer all of them. So we will, the format today is like, we're going to get um, our presenters to speak to a case. We'll get a discussion going and welcome a lively debate from our discussion as well as the audience. And then we'll have some closing remarks for the learning points for each case. So to start the first case, we have Dr. Raj Rajagopal from Brunei. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, and thanks to everyone for the invitation to be here and take part in this uh, symposium. Um, so let me um, open it from here. Right, uh, I've titled this, Back to the Future, More Balloon, Less Tent. Uh, the theme of the session is talking about the use of uh, DCBs in small vessels. And uh, this is a patient that we did uh, not that long ago. Uh, it was a 44-year-old lady, it's a young lady, was referred with non scemi uh, she had a history of hypertension and dyslipidemia. Angiogram showed severe three vessel disease. We had an MDT discussion. It was decided that she was not for CABG because she had poor distal targets, as you'll see later. Uh, so the plan was to do PCA to the LAD, then PCA to the circumflex and RCA. This is a diagnostic angiogram. A little look at the skill picture, and then I'll show you the running video. But you can see that it's severe diffuse disease in the LAD uh, quite severe starting from the mid segment all the way to the distal and apical segment. Um, and you can imagine why the surgeon couldn't find anywhere to uh, drop a lima here. And there was a similar, very irregular, horrible disease in the circumflex as well uh, from the mid to the distal portion with areas of ectasia and almost aneurysms. And there was severe stenosis in the distal circumflex. So that's the um, video. Let's play that. And uh, you can see that. Um, CVS kenosis in the LAD and circumflex. All right, so we had to come with a PCA strategy here, and we decided to go for a hybrid strategy. Um, so Raj, uh, maybe I can hold yep. your thoughts there before you tell us what you're going to do. Um, I, I thought I'd just get some discussion. This is a wonderful case. So very, very young, very, very young lady, 44 years old, non-diabetic, incidentally, you didn't show us the right. The right is okay, or uh, the right is okay. The right is okay. Okay. Um, can I just get some uh, comments about the definition here? Um, is Sunny online from Hong Kong? Sunny, are you on? Oh, hello. This is from Hong Kong. Sunny Sunny from Hong Kong. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Sunny. I, I don't know where they can see the images well, so maybe I'd like to ask you first: Is this truly small vessel disease, or is it just diffuse disease? Uh, how do you tell the difference uh, here, Sunny? Well, um, I guess I would first uh, do uh, some intravascular uh, imaging first uh, to to see um, um, the uh, degree of uh, disease uh, uh, inside the uh, distal LAD. And to me, I guess if uh, if the vessel is like around two millimeters, I guess it would I would uh, think it was. Uh, Small vessel. Sorry, Sunny, you said uh, what size is defined as small for you? Um, I guess to me it's uh, below 2 mm, 2 millimeters. So 2 mm. Um, yeah. can, can I 
take a poll from my discussions here. Fahim, uh, small is two? I mean, small is anything below two point, you know, two point five and below. Certainly, anything below two five is small in my book. So yeah. sm two is definitely small. Now we're going up two point five. Can I get another number, <laughs> maybe, Ro Rosalie? Yeah, I, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, definition of small is anything two point seven five and small and less. But the very small is uh, two point two five and less. So there are probably two different aspects because obviously the two two point two five and less than that. Uh, would pose a, a much more challenging uh, aspect in terms of uh, long-term outcome. So, uh, in this case, I think in the basket small, they define it as 2.75. So, I, I think when we say small, uh, definitely 2 is small. Is 2.75 also small, uh, Fahim? I mean, yes, by definition it is, but in terms of, uh, you know, uh, where you're going to see uh, a, an inflection point in outcomes, it's really the 2.5 and below where there's a difference, a significant difference in outcomes. Do, do you have evidence to back that up? You say 2.5 is yeah, I mean, worse outcomes? Yeah, so as I said, vessels below 2.5 are where you start seeing more restenosis for obvious reasons. You're not able to, you know, you don't get a good luminal area to begin with. And then there's an obligatory loss of uh, lumen with the uh, neointimal hyperplasia. And uh, you, you, you do see more restenosis in that, in that group. And uh, Sunny actually mentioned imaging. Uh, so I asked Chi Yang this uh, for this patient, maybe you switch back to the NGO. Uh, what would be the preferred imaging modality that help you define small vessel disease and intervention for this patient? Okay, I, th I think if you're talking about the LAD, um, there didn't seem to be very good flow. So I think uh, with OCT, you're probably going to struggle to. Um, uh, see very much in this case. So I, uh, for, for the LED anyway, my preference would be um, IVUS. Um, so I think it would be useful, it's, it's usually useful to, uh, to, if you can, IVUS before you do any ballooning. In this case, because it's sub, subtotal occlusion or, or very poor distal flow, I might um, re-image after I balloon because sometimes the vessel uh, uh, grows a little bit after, after you restore um, anti-grade flow. So I, I, I would probably um, measure only after um, I, uh, I, I restore some, uh, some flu. Sorry, I can't see the audience very well, but if you do have any question, just pitch in, you know, just ask away the questions and uh, redirect those questions to Raj. But just, just feel free to ask uh, those questions. Uh. So uh, one other thing, Raj, before you go on, is that I, I see that in this young lady, there's a lot of uh, aneurysmal-like segments in the circumflex. Uh, Rosli, would this qualify as some form of Kawasaki's disease or...? How do you, how no, do you I, I, I don't really, th I mean, I don't think so because Kawasaki is usually involves more ostium and proximal mm -hmm. lesion and this is more, more distal. And the most common cause of uh, aneurysmal ectasia is still with atherosclerosis. So this would pro probably constitute as atherosclerosis. But Jack, just to end on, I know that uh, we didn't hasn't said anything yet, but uh, in, in our, I mean, in practices around the world, especially in our parts of the world, imaging is... I must say it's not common, and uh, I would probably not image this. Uh, and I would just uh, predilate first, and then uh, assess the site, and then decide. So I think to make to uh, on the practical side, I think a lot more centers do not image uh, as much as uh, you know, they would like to. Hui, would you image this case? Uh, reckon? Yeah. I think it's definitely uh, imaging will do uh, important drones in this kind of case. Um, um, we see a lot of mismatch in between the uh, diameter based on um, angiographic and an inverse finding, especially for proximal LED. There are some things, uh, sometimes we see uh, consider a small uh, LED, but when we do inverse, we recognize it's not small anymore. So, uh, Sunny, uh, your choice for imaging here before Raj show you what he did. Sunny, you're muted, uh, sorry. Hello, yeah, I guess I would go for Arvis because uh, it's quicker and I'm not sure about the renal function uh, with the OCT, it probably needs some more contrast. And as the previous, talker, uh, previous uh, speaker said, there is, uh, and the, it's very narrow and the flow may not be that good for OCT. So two for Arvis, let's see what Raj uh, did. Right, so we made a strategy. Uh, I think for us, it was really important to uh, the, the, lady, the patient's age was really important. She's 44 years old. And 
at some point in the future, she might need a Lima uh, in, for the LED. So we wanted to avoid, if at all possible, putting in any metal in the very distal LED because that'll take a Lima out of the equation uh, for a life. So our plan was to uh, do a drug eluting stent in the mid LED and a DEB in the distal LED, that's avoiding metal. And as uh, Chiang said, I think it's, uh, OCT would be, and Sunny said as well, it'd be difficult, I think, to do OCT here because of almost subtotal occlusion. So we went for IVAS imaging. And uh, Jack was very right. I mean, is, this is not exact, I don't know. Can we call this a small vessel? So before we uh, show, we had to pre-dilate a bit with a 1.5 mm um, semi-compliant balloon, then a two millimeter semi-compliant balloon. At this point, we did IVAS. So I got a couple of shots from the IVAS. Distally, the lumen is about two millimeter. When I say distal, we didn't go all the way down. Um, you can, um, you see where the uh, second balloon is, a two millimeter balloon. The IVAS started about halfway, uh, to, uh, around where the balloon is. That's where we, that's where we dilated. Uh, so it's a two millimeter lumen, but the vessel is almost three millimeter distally. Calcium, mild to moderate at worst. And proximally, the LED was quite big, 3.75 millimeters. So maybe I take a pause here. I'll ask Chi Yang, if you have this imaging, you already pre-dilated some. What are the pointers towards saying this will work better with a stand versus DCB if the initial strategy was hybrid? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it also will depend on um, how the balloon behaves on angio um, uh, when, when you're, when you're pre-dilating. I think the, the, the role of imaging here would be to decide on a size um, for your uh, balloon. So if you, if, if you size the vessel already, then you use a one to, you know, one is to one uh, balloon to pre-dilate. If the, if the balloon is able to dilate well, um, then, then I think that, 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 that means you know, you, you've, you've prepared the lesion well. Um, if flow after that is still preserved, you don't have a lot of dissections, it looks okay, um, then maybe you know, just, just a, a, a balloon approach might be good enough. How, how much calcium before you adjudicate whether the DCB is a good choice? Is that a factor at all? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I don't think that we have a score for that. Yeah, we have scores for uh, how, how, how difficult it is uh, likely to, be, uh, to, to, to get a good stand result. But uh, we don't have a score for you know, what, what is good for, or, or better for DCB versus um, uh, DES. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't have a, an objective um, answer um, um, uh, uh, for that, to be honest. So uh, Rosley has Ivers eyes, so he doesn't need Ivers. So if we are doing this without Ivers now, uh, the balloon expanded pretty well. Is that the same sizing or how we have done it differently? Yeah, I, I, as um, you know, after you dilate, uh, then you will have to use uh, nitroglycerin and see what is vessel size and you have to estimate. Uh, I would uh, try to use DCB even in the mid-segment as much as possible. So we try to... Uh, you know, prepare the vessel as well as you can. Make sure, uh, I would tend to use a scoring balloon or even a tapping balloon. Ensure that it's quite full and then you see the results. If, even if there's a dissection, as long as the flow is good, that's uh, good enough to do the CB. But if you have a dissection, you tend to wait a while to ensure that there's no chance or risk of uh, abrupt closure because if, let's say, you wait after about five minutes or so, the flow is still very good. Dissection is not getting worse then you can use a DCB. So we're persisting with a proximal stand, a distal DCB hybrid. So No, not... I'm, I'm, con uh, yeah, I'm contemplating DCB all the way. DCB all the way. So DCB all the way rather than a hybrid approach. Raj, please. Yeah, no, that, we, we sort of had that in mind. I mean, as much DCB as possible, as little stent as possible. So after the IWAS, uh, we went ahead with further preparation. Now with the... Uh, now with, okay, after the IWAS, we went ahead with further vessel preparation, now clearly with DEB in mind. So we did a scoring balloon first, 2.5 scoring balloon, followed by a three millimeter NC balloon, which is our normal preparation for a DEB. And uh, this is what the angiogram looked like. It, it looks fantastic. Uh, I just take a pause here to ask Hui, right? So Raj pulled out four or five balloons to do this. Can you do this with just a upfront 2.5, 3 scoring balloon and without the one five step up uh hui i think i i would do the same with raj uh, just go with a small balloon first and then see how balloon act in in these uh, uh situations and then as Ross lee said uh i don't want to get a nasty dissection or a flow limitations after balloon in inflations so just go slow uh see how is the balloon um 
2.5 scoring balloon or cutting balloon and then uh, see the flow after that. So at this point, any questions from the audience or online? Sorry, I can't really see the online questions very well. Uh, but it, it looks fantastic at the moment. So Fahim, is this a full DCB uh, approach for a young lady for you? Yeah, or to, to, you be, to be honest, uh, I like the result right now. I see the dissection that Raj is pointing out to. The flow is good. Um, you've got pretty good luminal gain. Um, this is uh, one patient where if you can avoid putting in long lengths of stents, it would be good. Uh, so, so I would be inclined to just DCB and just watch. So uh, now the question for me, I'm going to ask Chi Yang followed by the Ivers eyes here, is you going to put in the Ivers, obviously you already have the Ivers. What on Ivers would sway you to cover your stent? And what angiographically convinces you that this is okay without Ivers, uh, Chi Yang? Yeah, okay. So if, I, I think for me, in, in, in this kind of situation, if I see uh, long segments of uh, dissection, which I expect probably to see <laughs> based on what the angiogram is showing, um, and if, if, the, if the arc of the uh, dissection um, uh, is more than two quadrants, so more than 180 degrees in this case, um, then you know, for, for those segments, I probably might be more inclined to uh, uh, um, stent. Uh, just to tack everything down. So 270 arc of dissection, still no mirror hematoma, no spiral dissection, is Dimitri flow. This, so 270 is your, your cutoff. Yeah, for him. Yeah, I would, if my intention is to DCB this, I would not I was it. <laughs> it would look horrible, so, so, you know so, that. Yeah, let, let's, so let's listen to So I would go with the angi angiographic yeah. findings, this good flow. DCB and watch it for five minutes in the lab and then just so, go So, So that's a good point. I mean, if you already decided on DCB, you're just going to put DCB anyway. And, and whatever you see, I was not going to sway you. Uh, yeah, I would prepare the mid-segment a bit better. I think if it's a bit under, then I would probably choose a slightly bigger balloon or scoring and make it better because I want to try and see whether I can DCB uh, and not give up unless, of course, uh, a dissection is clearly there and you have to stent it. So, 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 uh, so we come to the question agree with him. If you want to go for DCB, the most important thing is the flow and also the residual stenosis. Uh, uh, restenosis. If you have a residual stenosis of more than 30%, the chances of uh, in, uh, the late uh, outcome of in, uh, 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 restenosis is going to be much higher. As long as you can get a minimal, a fairly acceptable residual, uh, uh, residual stenosis, restenosis, and the flow is good, you DCB it. Because the vessel will heal, it will grow. And when you use Pecotaxel, 70% of patients will have a vessel enlargement over time. Uh, Hui? Uh, I may do uh, a bit differently. Uh, after this kind of, uh, of uh, angel fighting, I will do Ivers again and see, is it really a, a small vessel uh, for mid-LED? If it's uh, 275 uh, and above, then I'm ready to stand. So we're jumping back and forth between whether you need IVUS here. I think the yeah. problem with doing an IVUS in this vessel is that you have no good landing zones. Your distal landing zone is way down, down at the, you know, way distal. And if you stent the, that dissected segment, you're going to end in a lot of plaque. And that's the problem with stenting these lesions. And so I agree with, you know, with Rossley said, you know, do a more prolonged inflation. If you're worried about the dissection, you know, leave a balloon up for four minutes, nothing happens. The patients do fine. That's the old fashioned POBA style. And then try to DCB in this particular case. Uh, if you can just shortly, if you want to and to assess, not just flu, then I think a physiology testing may be useful, uh, but not an IVUS. Okay, so um, I think we discussed very well on this crucial point, which is when a DCB, you think it's likely to work based on either angiographic or IVUS. One last pointer or question back to Ross Lee is that he will go with a more aggressive when there's really a dissection rather than try DCB now. Would that predispose you to more dissection and therefore a higher chance of a stand bail out? Uh, not really. I, I think uh, it's not dissection per se, it's the residual uh, restenosis. And this really depends on number one, the balloon that you use, the size, and secondly, the vessel that uh, you think is, it's, uh, that you see. Obviously, the vessel now is larger than what it started off with. So your balloon that you chose may not be, may be actually be undersizing. So if you feel that you're undersizing it, you don't get as good results, it's good to go in with a bigger balloon, dilate it, and give it a chance. So I hope I'm not ignoring Sunny. Uh, so if you have to say something, please say so because I can't see you. Uh, 
Chiang, you have one last comment? No, I, I think just, just to give the opposite opinion, I think, you know, because you don't have a good landing zone or, or you cannot identify a good landing zone on angiogram, um, that's even more reason to use uh, imaging in order to, you know, find somewhere that is... That, okay, that is, well, is. we're not going to go back and forth. <laughs> I think we have images at Ivers Eyes here. So, Raj, please. Right, okay. So, uh, summarize. We had good lumen expansion, no significant recoil. Um, dissections that I felt were quite significant in the mid portion. And this was the end of 2020 when I did that case. I was a little bit more conservative uh, with uh, putting in scans uh, as compared to DEBs if there is significant dissection in terms of leaving dissections behind. So I treated the distal portion with a 2.5 by 30 DEB. And then, well, the mid to distal portion with another DEB, a 2.75 by 20. And then I placed a skint to cover the uh, areas of dissection. It was a 2.5 by 38 DES, post dilated to 3.75 millimeters proximally. And this is what we had after the two DEBs, sorry, and the stent. Um, there was dissection at the distal stent edge. Now, what I did at that point was, uh, the, actually the pictures are in a slightly different order. I was very unkeen to put another stent in. I wanted to try every chance to leave, you know, stop at this point. So I stopped with the LAD, went ahead and stented the circumflex. Uh, that was pretty straightforward. Uh, we did IVERS and stented it and then came back to the LAD and checked again. And the dissection looked like this. It was not getting better. It was actually looking a bit worse. Um, so as you can see, I put in a stent there, 2.25 by 12, but would uh, the panel do anything differently? So I, I'm going to, in the interest of time, ask Raj to finish up, including his teaching point first. Then we'll go to Fahim's case to talk about this part, about okay. what to do when you see it record. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So, so this was a final result. Um, we had good lumen expansion, no significant dissection. So to summarize, what we did in this patient was treated uh, the distal LAD with DEB, that's the green part, and there is a drug eluting stain just in the mid LAD, and that leaves the distal LAD um, still a target for a lima in the future. Uh, sorry, the RCA was not normal, it was diseased. We brought her back a month later to treat the RCA, and we did a check angiogram uh, on the LAD that looked good. So the summary is, it was a challenging case, both because of the anatomy and the fact that she was a young woman. Uh, so we did a DCB in the distal LAD, and that helped avoid a stent. And uh, we talk about preserving the LAD for a lima. We, we want to say that we could actually create a target for a future lima graft. And what helped us here was imaging, vessel preparation, and slow balloon inflations. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Raj. Uh, great case. Thanks, thanks a lot. So um, I, I have some questions there at the end about what to do with recoil and whether you need to do a follow-up angiogram or how to follow up this group of patients. But we'll defer that after listening and seeing uh, Fahim's case. Thanks, Fahim. Thank, thank you, Jack. Uh, so uh, my case is actually a lot simpler and uh, uh, not as extensive, but uh, hopefully it'll illustrate the point. Just a, f a disclaimer <laughs> up front is that we do a lot of DCBs for um, small vessels in our practice. About 30% of our cases in, have a DCB somewhere or the other, either as a hybrid strategy, stent and DCB, or just DCB alone. So we're big believers in it. And so uh, talking about stenting and small vessel disease is uh, somewhat uh, unpalatable, but let, let, nonetheless. Um, so here's the case, a 77-year-old man, a man a hypertension, hyperlipidemia, who had a cabbage in the 1990s, uh, presented with a non-STEMI, uh, and was actually managed medically initially um, and, uh, you know, what I don't put up here is that he was, he he was sort of sent home um, and then came back with really refractory intractable symptoms. The symptoms just won't get better on really good medical therapy. And why he was sent home after non-STEMI is a separate uh, subject of a separate discussion. And this is what the RCA looked like. We thought this was a recanalized kind of CTO. And that's what the Lima to the LED looked like. And there were no other graphs. Um, this is what we thought was the culprit. And so you can see there is a circumflex lesion. It is uh, hazy and possibly probably calcific up here. It is calcific here. And, you know, this is the 
distal circumflex. So it's almost like a core dominant system, uh, if, you, if you will. Uh, so, ex so pretty extensive disease. And I will pause over yeah, here. Yeah, maybe you can take a pause because yeah. you never shown me a simple case before in your life. So you're consistent. Uh, the patient is in atrial fibrillation or? Yes, the patient is also in atrial fibrillation. So 77 years old, AF, post-bypass, right. diffuse yeah. disease. And, and very uh, symptomatic. I mean, very exceptionally symptomatic. symptomatic. Yeah. Yeah. So just just uh, audience uh, uh, feedback, uh, Prashna on site says that the first case was actually not small vessel, which we thought it was. It was actually diffuse disease, but good good comment. And that, that was also one of the concluding remarks to pick up and differentiate between small versus non-small. So it's truly non-small. So uh, with this case, I, I will go with the x-ray eyes first. Uh, uh, Rosli, your, your comments. Uh, I think uh, um, from here, I see that uh, the circumflex is um, significantly diseased, but the distal doesn't appear to be that bad. And obviously, the right uh, is also diseased and um, um, probably at the most, uh, it, it's possible that distal cirque might also be significant. So yes, uh, I would in this case uh, attempt a DCB for the distal cirque, but the proximal, I tend to uh, want to stand this because it goes into the left main. So one, one comment from Hui then, uh, which one will you treat? I think the uh, patient is a, a non stemi so it's it's really difficult to, to decide which is the complete lesions in this kind uh, of, of situations. But anyway, I think because of uh, RCA can be considered as a, a CTO uh, lesion, so um, uh, CERC can, can, can be the uh, the ones I want to treat. Um, a very diffuse disease from, I think uh, the lesion start from left main and then go uh, all the way to a cirque down. Uh, 77 years old, AF, um, so it can be considered as a high bleeding risk. So if you put in a stand or multiple stand, then the anti-thrombotic uh, therapy after that will be very, very complex. And then the risk of having any uh, of major bleeding will be high, I think. Okay, uh, so uh, Fahim, we're, we're thinking that maybe the CERC it doesn't really look like small vessel disease here. The at best a co-dominant right. So what 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 is your strategy? So um, you know just to go over the issues with the case and you know just to put it up here, um, I agree that up here approximately it's not small vessel, but down here it is quite small. Um, we felt that the mid circ was hazy, and I didn't know what you know what was going on over there. Is it calcium? Is it uh, clot? Is it a bit of both? The left main is oops, sorry. The left main is calcific for sure. Uh, and as I said, the distal disease is diffuse, and the question is, what do you do about it? Do you stent it? Do you DCB it? And of course, some of the issues in, in this whole nexus is. Are you going to be able to get devices to go down? And you're talking about going all the way down here. So while in this LAO cranial view, the distance seems relatively short, but it is a long way down here. You have to take devices from up here and take them all the way down there. So device transit would be an issue. Um, and so um, our thoughts were to start ballooning and see what, see what the hell happens. And so we went ahead and put in a wire and then ballooned up here and nothing, nothing would go. A one, uh, you know, a two or balloon wouldn't cross, and I truncated the number of slides because I thought we had to keep this short. Uh, a, a two or balloon didn't go, a one to five balloon didn't go, and uh, you know, even a one or balloon had a hard time. So um, at that point, then no choice, picked up a rotablation uh, burr and burred into the uh, vessel uh, proximally, uh, and then to get devices to go distally was even more challenging because even after doing so, we were able to cross the mid-circumflex, but then getting a device uh, uh, to go distally to dilate was very hard, and I had to use a guide catheter extension to get a device to go all the way distal. And we dilated, and at that point, uh, after dilating, you know, this is what, what uh, you know, um, this is where we were. And so I'm gonna pause over here and perhaps ask the, the panel that would you with such difficulty to get devices down, would you still consider DCB or would you stand? Yeah. So there, there's a, another interesting point. So you have a very calcified lesion, you need arterectomy, you need prepping. Uh, would this case automatically default to stenting? Uh, Raj, your, your opinion? Yeah, 
Yeah, I think I think um, I need to see the result on imaging ideally to see uh, what the vessel looks like. Now, if it's calcified and after rotablation, you probably have a lot of uh, dissection. You may have dissections uh, because after rotablation, we need to do further pre-dilatation with NC balloons or so, and we may have to put a stent in. However, I think OCT would be really good here because if you have calcium nodules, the calcium looks very irregular. And uh, one thing we do now is if there are lots of calcium nodules, and even after rotablation, if you put in a stent, that can be malaposition because the nodules will protrude push the skins inside and lead to malaposition, which can never be fixed. So in fact, a lot of calcium might actually become an indication for DEB. And that is something we have um, used uh, quite a few times to demonstrate it. Um, so I would struggle to make a decision here without uh, further imaging. Yeah, so let's say no imaging again. Uh, is there any evidence to favor a stenting approach for heavily calcified lesions over DCB? Yeah. I think there's two issues here. Number one is a proximal lesion, and I don't think uh, there is... Uh, I, I would still like to consider stenting for that. The issue is, I think, trying to get the, the, the DCB to cross into the distal vessel, so the uh, distal lesion. So I, I would actually, uh, if I want to try to attempt, I've got a good uh, a deeply seated uh, extension guide, catheter. I'll try to put in the balloon when it's like, uh, you know, uh, partially uh, deflated and then try to push it in. If it does go in, then it's quite likely my, my DCB can actually go in. If it doesn't, uh, then I would uh, think about putting in stand. A DCB is not as deliverable as a stand. Okay, that's also a good point. Angulator cert is uh, famous for long DCB, not to cross. Uh, Sunny, sorry, I really neglected you because I can't see you. Maybe I can ask you, uh, in your experience, if you had to put in a 2-0 stand, would you rather put in a 2-0 DCB or 2-0 stand? For example, the distal cert here. Uh, Sunny, if you're on again. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, if it's if it's if I decide to put in a two O stand, um, I, I I may have second thoughts, but uh, I I may consider putting in a DCB instead too because uh, it's such a small size stand, uh, for me it's quite uncomfortable. I think it will uh, uh, um, reach the nose very quickly. But likewise, a small vessel tends to dissect faster as well. With that so far, him. Yeah. So what I deliberately um, excluded when I presented is, is that we put a guideliner down and we took a 2.0 DCB, a paclitaxel coated balloon, and it wouldn't go. Okay. And Rusty kind of nailed it on the head. It, these DCBs don't track so well. So at that point, I shrugged my shoulders and said, okay, now what? And this is what we did. We took a 2.0 26 Onyx with a guideliner in place, and you can see that it just flew down. And so that was a, a relief. Um, and then it was basically just stenting the whole thing. So without going through too much, you know, we basically put in a bunch of stents all the way back and post -dilated, dilated them with appropriate size balloons. We did not image in this particular case. Um, because I just, you know, did the best I felt looking at the angiogram. And uh, actually, uh, you, you, know, you know, just if you look at it before on the left and after on the right, we were fairly satisfied with the result. Um, the patient actually did quite well. You know, his follow-up, he did well for four years and then was finally lost to follow-up. We actually were told that he had an angiogram done at one of our sister hospitals in Singapore, and everything looked pretty good. And by, based on the report, everything was patent, including the circumflex that we did. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have pictures to, to show that. So um, just to sort of summarize, you know, why did I stent the small vessel? Of course, the first issue was that I couldn't get a DCB to go down. So that sort of, sort of nails it. But there's some other I issues to sort of consider. You know, the first is that the distal vessel disease was diffuse and long. And so while, yes, DCB, we believe in it strongly, you know, sometimes these long uh, segments of disease are difficult to dilate and difficult to uh, get a sustainable result. Um, and the distal disease was quite severe. I mean, I had a one hell of a time crossing all the way distal with a one to five balloon, had to have a guideliner there. And one of the things that sort of was, even when we were trying with the DCB was in, was in my head was that, well, what the hell, what would happen if I have to go back and rescue? So let's say I do a DCB and then I stand proximally and then distally the vessel starts looking like rubbish. Am I gonna be able to get something to go at that point? And so in this particular case where I was really concerned about the longevity or even the stability of a distal DCB, at the back of my mind, I thought that stenting would probably be safer. Um, it just so happened that the patient made the decision for us. He didn't let the DCB go. 
and it, uh, and surprisingly, and you know, credit to the stent, the stent went, and so you know that was that was pretty good. And so the question then comes is that why not stent? You know, and you know there is not a lot of good high quality data out there, unfortunately. Uh, but the data does suggest that for small vessels, you can you know you you can get fairly acceptable results with stenting, and this is. One piece of data presented relatively recently at EuroPCR, the DISCO-9 study, where when you look at your, you know, TLR rates and stent thrombosis rates with small vessel stenting, they're actually not too bad. I mean, you're talking about, you know, low frequency events. Now, of course, selection bias is always a play, comes into play when you talk about these registry type data. But, you know, the, the, at least the, the general anecdotal experience has been it's not too bad. And then uh, you know, this is another piece of data that was uh, sort of presented uh, earlier in the year, you know, sort of clinical outcomes of uh, PCI with uh, uh, Onyx, you know, small vessel versus large vessel. And this was sort of derived from the Onyx 1 data set. Onyx 1, just to remind you, was, you know, uh, the Onyx 1 clear data set was a combination of the Onyx 1 randomized trial and the Onyx 1 sort of single arm registry. And they put all that data together and then compared basically the small vessels versus the not so small vessels. And it, you know, again, accepting the limitations of this kind of comparison, it's non-randomized, it's somewhat observational, it is uh, hypothesis generating. But, you know, if you look at it, you know, the small vessel disease patients were not surprisingly more diabetic, uh, had more previous interventions, again, so not, not a surprise, uh, and had more multivessel disease, and of course the reference lumen was obviously smaller. That's why they're small vessel. Um, and, you know, but with pretty long lengths of stenting, I mean, you know, we put in a mile long of stent in the case that I showed you, you know, 41 millimeters of uh, stents in small vessels is not trivial. So it is not, these are not focal small vessel disease entities. These are long segments of presumably diffuse disease with small vessels. Um, and if you look at the outcomes, they're not too bad. I mean, the actual difference of outcomes at 12 months between those who have small vessel disease, which is in green, and not small vessel disease, which is in blue, uh, is not significant. It's in the single digits. I mean, numerically, there is a difference. It may be significant if you took larger numbers. But in, even in absolute terms, the absolute numbers are not too bad. Of course, the, the caveat is that you have to do these cases with a lot of preparation, a lot of post dilation. Uh, either have IVUS eyes of Rossley or, or use IVUS, but either way, it's, it, it, do, it, it does involve a lot of work. It's not just putting in a stent and just going home uh, after a 10, millimeter, 10 atmosphere inflation. And if you look at all the clinical outcomes across the board, you know, whether you look at stent thrombosis, you look at death, you know, lesion failure and all that, numerically the outcomes are worse with uh, small vessel disease. And that's kind of accepted, you know, small vessels do reach to nose more. But if you look at the absolute numbers, they're still, still in the single digits, which is not too bad for this sort of set of patients where, you know, the, we know that the outcomes in the long run, at least historically with POBA and historically with uh, bare metal stent, were actually dismally poor. And even with the earlier generation DES, the results were not great because these vessels were not prepped and stented with a certain measure of aggression that you need. And so to conclude, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, stents, I think, are a viable treatment option for small vessels uh, when you have to use them. Uh, and I think especially with some platforms where the stents track well and they, they you know, have good expansion limits, the 2.0 Onyx can go up to, I believe, three and a half. So it's, you know, it you gives you a fair amount of flexibility in dealing with these cases. And the overall TLR rates are acceptable. They're not, they're, you know, they are not as good as large ves larger vessels, but they're still pretty acceptable. And I think that, you know, that's just something for you to take home. I will stop here, ladies and gentlemen, and happy to answer any questions. Thanks, uh, Fahim. Thanks for presenting the data. We, uh, actually, I was just in a session with Dijan. He mentioned that a few years ago, it was published in the SCAR registry, showing that actually in the small vessel subgroup, DES did perform better, although it's non-randomized registry comparison than DES. And, and that's just registry data. So I think we need more data before we say small vessel is better for DCP versus DES. I think it's still a toss up in terms of a choice of a therapy. I agree, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that DCP is, in our own practice, is still a preferred option, but 
I think you, you, you don't have to feel guilty if you stand, uh, put in a 2-0 stand. I think that's the bottom line I would, I would like to say. I think we're, we're, we're all feeling a bit guilty, but okay, Raj, Raj you, you should, you want to answer your own question. So after the end, you re angel after 30 seconds, you see recoil. Would that, how do you gauge whether to treat the recoil or the image, is it? Oh, no, it's, it's a dissection that worried me, the stentage dissection. And uh, after about 15 minutes after scanning the circumflex, it looked maybe a little bit worse. And I thought that may not lead to good long-term results, so I chose to scan it. Well, worse on IVIS or worse on your angio? Angiogram. Angiogram. I didn't Angiogram. IVIS it. Okay. I, I think you have to understand that a dissection at the stent edge is a very different entity from a dissection in a balloon vessel that you've DCB'd. Correct. The implications are significantly worse with the stent. And so I think you did the right thing by stenting it once you'd committed to put a stent proximally. Yep. Okay, good Thanks. point. Uh, Chiyang, you want to say something? Uh, no, I think I think uh, I agree with all the points that have been uh, mentioned. Um, I think you know small vessel doesn't equal DCB always. I think there are other things to consider as well. The patient, you know, whether they're high bleeding risk or uh, and whatnot. So I think everything needs to be taken uh, um, uh, into consideration before you decide whether or not something needs to be stented or whether it can get away with uh, just a balloon. Yeah. Uh, Rosley, we are one minute away. So maybe your concluding remarks. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. We, sorry. Okay, so I think to be fair for a small vessel, um, we have two tunes that have comparable results. Even you stand it or you, or you DCB it, but I think uh, like uh, very young patients, like rush patient, then the DCB will have more meaning because you reserve uh, the target uh, there for bypass in the future if a patient needs. Otherwise, uh, in the case of, of Fahim, then if the, the balloon cannot cross, then stand will do well. So I think we have uh, two comparable uh, devices. Uh, Jack, okay. So uh, from what I've learned, and I've, I've learned uh, quite a bit uh, also from this, uh, you know, reminding ourselves about uh, how we treat our patients. So firstly, with regards to stenting and small vessel, uh, if you have to stent, uh, then you have to stent it. And for example, in this case, Fahim's case, difficulty in delivery. Or if you treat small vessels and you get dissection, then you know that you have to stent it. And at least you have data. Uh, in this case, uh, alluding to Onyx, the Onyx uh, One Clear shows that you've got comparable results and good, uh, you know, acceptable long-term data. At least, uh, no, not long-term, at least one-year data. So at least when you go in and you stent it, you know that uh, this is something that you can do. And as long as you do it well, then the results, uh, at least in, uh, in the middle term or short term, will still be very good. So if you have to stent it, obviously you've got to stent it. Now we come to DCB. And DCB is uh, something totally different altogether uh, and you you understand that when you do DCB then you have to have a change in terms of how you practice obviously it's not going to be as it's, it's simple to balloon and stand and good, good results but uh, you leave something there something behind and the risk of resonance is higher than the, the treatment is difficult so what is key DCB is really vessel preparation Treat it well, ensure that uh, you've got, uh, you know, uh, residual stenosis is not significant, means to say uh, aim for less than 30%. The flow is important. And once you've got flow and if you, uh, if you wait for a while, if you're concerned, you wait for a while because you don't want to try to convert uh, to put in a stand because then you'll be demoralized. Wait for it, the flow is okay, then do a DCB, ensure that you uh, just go nominal pressure or slightly higher than that and then you accept it. And once you see that the vessel uh, is, the flow is good, the risk of dissection, abrupt closure is going to be very, very low. I don't, nowadays don't see abrupt closure if I do this practice and you'll be, you'll be very satisfied because in the end you leave nothing behind. If you restudy these patients, the vessel will heal and there will be del vessel dilatation. So that's my take on DCV. Thanks, Rolly, for that uh, great uh, summary right on time. Uh, so I'm just uh, going to end by reminding folks that currently the guidelines support treatment for DCB for instant stenosis, followed by perhaps small vessel disease with a weaker definition, but not all common de novo disease. So we are still a bit far away, matching up to the gold standard of a well-deployed drug eluding stand as our current therapy for PCI in the current space. So I think we're still catching up. Uh, Bida is May. If a properly done DCB has an advantage, of no instant stenosis, TLR, stent thrombosis, provided you can achieve safe, short, and midterm outcomes. So that, that is a balance between DCB and DES. And with that, I'd like to thank my 
speakers from Singapore, Fahim, from uh, Brunei, Raj, my panelists from Malaysia, Dato Hui from Vietnam, and my colleague uh, uh, Chi Yang from Singapore. And I would like to mention, last but not least, two, two percent of the tech I hope are not neglected, Sunny from Hong Kong, who has tuned in very patiently, as well as Jelly, our chat moderator. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.